Okay, I think we will get started. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Jones, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to June's Learning for Leaders. Today we have um, an important topic um, about uh, public policy issues, and we're using DICAMBA as an example of that in that that has been a challenge in a number of states in, for the Extension Service. And there are other issues out there like it. So we thought we would use this opportunity to uh, really look at this as an example and learn from that and be prepared for the next thing that may come down the road. I wanna thank Robin Shepard and Mike Fitzner for putting together a, a great group of presenters today and we will get started with the presenters and have opportunity for some discussion at the end. So Robin and Mike, I will turn it over to you and uh, we'll get this ball moving. Well, Ed, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, share with directors across the country uh, some of the ideas that have uh, emerged as we've tried to address DICAMBA. DICAMBA also obviously has been uh, a challenge here on the technical side uh, as in the way that we do farm management education, but it has also been very challenging in the way the, the product and the allegations have followed uh, its use. Um, related to potential and very clear damage in much of the soybeans and cotton. This is an issue that's very near and dear to the upper Midwest and the Southern region, but I think as Ed points out, this has some really interesting lessons learned in the way we do public policy issues education. Uh, with that in mind, Mike Fitzner and I have put together a, an agenda for us. Uh, Mike is the division director in the Division of Plant Systems Protection at NIFA. Uh, Mike, I'll turn to you if you'd like to maybe make a few comments about, uh, from the agency perspective, how this issue has emerged, and then we'll, we'll get an idea from Larry Strecker from University of Tennessee about the, sort of how he has seen this unfold from the eyes of a specialist, and then we will walk through uh, the response from our IPM regional centers and some things that are now in the next step mode, um, and then we want to really do a little deeper dive into the issues uh, from a state extension director's perspective. Uh, what are some things that have been happening? What are some good practices in the way that we're supporting our faculty, staff, educators, both in counties and on campuses? Uh, what can we do as administrators to help with the concerns from industry, from stakeholders, and how can we better support our workforce? So Mike, I'll turn to you for a minute, just to sort of from the agency perspective, from how you and I kind of got involved in this, probably maybe set, a, set the stage a little bit more on the DACAMBA piece of this right off the bat. All right, uh, yes, uh, everybody hear me okay? Am I good? You're good, Mike. You're okay. Good. Yep. All right, well, I guess from, uh, you know, of course, from NIFA perspective, uh, we hear things indirectly, but we were aware of some of the uh, issues coming about because of DICAMB and all the issues with drift. And uh, it caused, of course, a lot of concern uh, across the land grant system and, and in our own agency and USDA and the Office of Pest Management Policy as well. And those issues included, uh, you know, we knew that researchers uh, and extension specialists were having trouble uh, getting pro new product formulations to test. But then at the same time, there was issues of, you know, quality, you know, there were some uh, concerns coming from industry itself about the quality of the science and the information coming out from universities about Bicamba and about Drift. And then there were threats of lawsuits and lawsuits that actually were f filed in several states. So I think all of us, uh, it, you know, caught, caught our attention. And it, and it really was then uh, the, the past DCOP chair, Chuck Hibbard, who asked, Robin and myself to you know look into this a little bit for ECOP executive committee and see if there you know and maybe identify some actions that cooperative extension directors and uh, administrators uh, may want to consider individually or collectively to address this issue. So uh, we in turn turn to the regional IPM centers and Lene Jess who's on the line uh, and they were you know kind enough to put together a survey of primarily of extension specialists, wheat, well, special, uh, extension wheat scientists uh, about this issue. So we just gather some basic uh, background information about that. And 
what we learned was that, um, well, first the primary question Chuck had asked is, you know, is extension responding as well as it should, or is there, you know, how is that response? And what we found from the survey, at least, was that it appears that, you know, the specialists and the system itself is responding pretty well to this issue. Uh, and also, the question was whether that they're getting the support they need from extension administration. So in both cases, we found that they are getting good support and they're dealing with this problem, but it is a very tricky problem. So uh, some of the things that came out of the survey were that uh, you know, the weed sign, uh, the extension weed specialist, okay, they'd never seen a more polarizing issue in agriculture actually about this dicamba issue and that uh, in interactions with uh, you know, some of the chem companies were very, uh, were, were almost damaged by this issue and you know, issues of uh, the credibility of uh, university weed scientists and one leading one specialist to remark that uh, this behavior is in no, no one's best interest. It resulted in a black eye on agriculture in the public's mind. So these are you know, kind of troubling things to hear. Also that the relationship with the industry has been strained by differences of opinions between university and industry on the volatility of the new formulations. There's been the threats of uh, litigation, uh, open records requests, and many other uh, things going on there. Um, so, uh, you know, they also said in the winter, in the early years, in the winter and spring of 2017, industry did a poor job of explaining the challenges of dicamba application and did not explain the importance of buffers and, and the importance of identifying sensitive species when it's used. So as Robin and I talked about this too, we want to, and we thought it was really important for this webinar to focus you know, prim primarily on these public issues, these broader issues, not the technical ones about the, the chemical and the, the formulations and the drift itself as much as you know, how does extension deal with these kinds of controversial topics and um, remain a, you know, a good source of, of information, but not get caught up in lawsuits and things like that. So that's really, I guess what we're hoping today will generate some discussion. Um, and, you know, some of those broader issues behind di dicamba and soybeans are, you know, this issue of herbicide resistance in general, of pesticide drift and off target impacts on, uh, you know, sensitive species and other, other, uh, other things in, in the environment. Uh, herbicide resistant GMO varieties and GMOs in general, that issue, and how should cooperative extension engage in these controversial topics. So I uh, also want to point out that there really are some great examples that came out in the survey of university weed scientists, extension weed scientists, you know, working very closely with government agencies, state regulatory agents, state departments of ag, and industry as well. There's great examples of that, the way that we like to see that happen. Also want to point out that the Weed Science Society of America has been working to help coordinate these efforts. It's another player in this that, you know, good to keep them in mind. So I guess with that, uh, you know, uh, turn it over to Larry Steckel and he talk a little bit about his experience and, you know, on the ground more and, and maybe focusing, you know, keeping the focus again on more on the public issues and a little less on the technical aspects of the problem. So Larry? Okay, Mike, uh, appreciate the, uh, especially that survey. Uh, I can tell you I've run in the last three years roughly 350 drift calls, uh, mostly with county agents and a lot of the results you shared with me, uh, you know, just now and earlier, uh, you know, those have been, been my experiences as well. I, I would agree. So um, anyway, Mark, uh, next next slide. Uh, by the way, I'm extension weed specialist here in, in West Tennessee. So um, the EPA, this is one thing that, one thing I guess maybe it's a positive, I think it is a positive out of this whole thing. The EPA uh, and, and this respective Department of Agriculture's and Extension in most every state, uh, weed scientists, we, when this thing broke loose, we literally had almost sometimes weekly, if not uh, 
uh, meeting every three to four weeks with them, uh, trying to get everybody on the same page, see what was happening. One of the things the EPA asked the extension weed scientists to do was to give an estimate as best we could of the damaged acres uh, from drift. And at that time, we were mostly looking at dicamba drift uh, from uh, dicamba tolerant soybeans or cotton onto uh, just conventional soybeans, which were mostly out there. And you can see those are the numbers. Those were our, our best estimates. They were very conservative, I can tell you that. Um, it, it just the drift, it's, I don't even want to call it drift. It, drift to me is it gets into the neighbor's next field a little bit. What we were seeing was just large landscape level uniform uh, symptoms from dicamba across big fields, uh, 100, 200 acre fields. Uh, it just, it just was just awe-inspiring how far we would see injury. And uh, anyway, now go ahead, next slide. Um, the Department of Ags uh, then had their official complaints. And you can see Arkansas had a boatload of them. A lot of that I think had to do with states and how bad they had the, the reports is their acres of dicamba tolerant crops. I think that was the biggest thing. You had more acres, you saw more drift uh, at the time. Uh, in Tennessee, at the time this was taken, we had 118 um, official drift complaints to the Department of Agriculture. Um, and you think 118, well, that, well, that doesn't seem so bad. Well, that's uh, the way it's, it's documented is one complaint can be 25 fields. Because uh, typically it was a farmer's entire crop. That's why this thing got such to be such a hot button issue. It wasn't just a field. It was as a farmer's entire crop was drifted on. Uh, and oftentimes, numerous times, not just once. So a lot of emotion, I can tell you. Uh, I've done this 30 years now, and the, and the calls I've run in the last couple of years have been the, some of the most uh, stressful I've been on. Uh, you, you get somebody with their whole crop drifted on. I know I was out with the county agent just this last spring, and, uh, and the farmer, I think he had a little bit just emotionally unstable, uh, and you know we felt threatened uh, out there. And, and, and I've never done that before, but that's, that's where we were with this. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So yeah, just we just run through this. So just to kind of give you an idea on dicamba drift complaints, prior to 2016 and the technology rolling out, uh, the Tennessee Department of Ag would have maybe one a year. Go ahead, next, next bullet. In 16, um, there, there were um, 40 official complaints, around 400 fields. My best estimate was 90,000 acres. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, then when the technology did roll out with a label uh, in 2017, we had 136 official complaints in Tennessee. 105 of them were on soybean fields. It, it, it roughly, because there was the average number of fields affected per uh, uh, official complaint was seven, so it's about or eight, so it's about 840 fields uh, were, were were damaged. My estimate at the time was 400,000 acres of soybeans in the state, and that didn't count trees and people's yards and all that. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, this is actually Illinois' uh, records, uh, and you can see, considering there's 22 million acres of corn and soybeans in that state, and they have maybe you know, 100 complaints, and on dicamba, none up until 2017, and then there were over 500 by 2018. Uh, and it just overwhelms these Department of Agriculture inspectors. I really felt for them. Uh, I, I crossed paths with a lot of them out in these fields. Uh, I don't know how they did it. Uh, I know one complaint at Tennessee, um, um, one of the complaints uh, she ran, uh, Miss Terry, was uh, one complaint. It was uh, 27 fields. She, and there was 84 different suspects. She had to go through all their spray records of 84 different people just for one of those complaints. So it's, it's overwhelming uh, and it's causing some of them quite frankly to take early retirement and quit and find other jobs. I'll go ahead, next, next slide. Uh, so one of the big things we've been trying to do is education because I, I think we all felt that could help. Uh, and so in, in 2018, um, we, we led the effort for training in the state of Tennessee. We trained 2,800 applicators. Uh, all of it, basically we rolled out a, a module uh, to, to the county agents and then they, 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 they had a lot of their people actually just come in typically to the office and uh, do it there. Uh, we charged $25 um, for it as well. 
yeah, another thing we did, another effort was we did a bunch of YouTube videos in season. And I'm still doing those, trying to address uh, stewardship issues. Uh, last year we had those viewed over 2,100 times, and then Montana and BASF are doing a lot of training as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in 2018 in Tennessee, we were all in on dicamba. Almost all our beans were, were extend beans. Almost all our, our big 75% of our cotton was extend cotton. So, uh, and the reason they're doing it is Roundup isn't working. Uh, it's either that or get grow, grown up with weeds. So um, they, they've all went to extend. Um, so after the training, and even though we had all these people going to all these acres, go ahead, the next slide. Um, I think this, yeah, well, and, and then 19, um, this, this past year, we trained 2,400, um, got a blog out there 3,600 uh, times, it's been seen uh, with a lot of stewardship type information, we've done a bunch of YouTube videos, and again, we've got a pretty good effort, I think I got one more slide, maybe, no, I guess not, anyway, uh, in 18, our complaints went down to about 50, uh, and I think that training did help quite a bit. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, but part of the thing I know uh, a lot of these fields I've run and Mike alluded to it as well, is a lot of times when I walk these fields and you start looking at records and looking at weather at the time of application, uh, it's, it's typically, it's, it's, it's wind. I mean, it, it was windy uh, and it, it went downwind. But I, I've walked a number of these fields where it, I, I just, I can't come to any of the conclusion that far, unless the farmer's just totally lying to me. Uh, that, you know, he sprayed on this date with this wind direction. I can go back and look at the weather, and I have. Uh, that that dicam is moving against the wind in a long way. So there, uh, to me, I, and most of my colleagues, 90% of them that walk as many fields as I have, I think, well, I know they're in the same opinion that volatility is part of the issue. So training by itself, can't we can't train that molecule to stay put under those conditions. So we are doing a lot of research, a lot of my colleagues and I, on trying to figure out how to, maybe do a better job from the volatility standpoint. I know just recently Tom Mueller, my colleague at Knoxville, has done some work looking at tank mixes and, and, um, and, and particularly with Roundup. Uh, Roundup can decrease the, the, the pH of the spray tank and that increases the volatility of dicamba. And that's one of the findings we found. Uh, and we are actually using that now in a educational sense uh, by telling folks, especially if they're around any sensitive areas, just leave Roundup out of the tank, uh, come back with it later, or, you know, maybe use something else for grass. So uh, that's, that's just kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I tried to be fast and quick. Well, thanks, Larry. Uh, we appreciate the, the overview. Um, as Mike indicated a few minutes ago, in 2018, Mike and I worked with the regional IPM centers to do an assessment of what's happening on the ground. And on your screen now, you see some of the, the things that we pulled from that experience that um, have to do with um, the way the requests are coming in. It's one of those issues that's very hard to say no to, that we're getting requests to uh, take a look at this from the aspect of both application management, but also we get drawn into these diagnostic sets of issues. And so the producers are coming to us asking for help. Um, and because of that on the diagnostic side and the litigation that's swirling, uh, role definition has become very important across our states uh, to make sure that what we're doing is different from regulatory enforcement. Um, I think what you heard Larry talk about, what Mike talked about, this idea that uh, in industry and in the news media, we've uh, kind of taken a blistering unfairly about both the science-based information that we're providing, but it doesn't just stop there. We've been attacked on our research principles. We've been attacked on our role. Um, we've been asked to uh, respond to, you know, helping assess damages and people not understand why we don't uh, do that. Um, and again, it, a lot of this has swirled around related to the uh, litigation that in the environment that this has caused. Um, I'd like to turn to Lene Jess for just a moment. Lene is the director of the North Central IPM Center. She also helps coordinate the centers nationally. Um, she's often kind of on the front line for requests for information from USDA and sometimes even EPA. Um, she provides that leadership to the centers across the country. And 
Lene, maybe if you could kind of take it to the next step, where is this issue kind of, where is it at now? What are the kinds of things that are happening? How are, how are the centers supporting IPM coordinators across the country? Sure, thank you, Robin. Um, as Robin said, I'm the director of the North Central IPM Center located at Michigan State University. And then I have co-directors, Laura Isles and Darren Mueller at Iowa State University. And we've all been kind of working on this issue. Um, Mike, Mike said we did have a couple rounds of questions that we sent out to weed specialists last year. Um, and then we asked them earlier this winter if they thought it'd be a good idea to have some sort of a working group. One of the things that our North Central IPM Center does is we fund working groups. Um, they're self-led, self-directed, that type of thing. We try to pull people together um, to collaborate and network on different issues. And it's not just people from our region. All of our working groups have people from outside the region and internationally, especially Canada, um, Ontario area. Some of the working groups are from the Western part of Canada that they have members. But one of the things we asked them um, was if they thought we should have a working group on this issue. And it was interesting because some of the weed scientists, the extension specialists said they were meeting out on this issue. But one big thing that came up from everybody was something needs to be done with the horticultural crops and the specialty crops. Um, there hasn't been, they felt there hasn't been as much education on those crops. It's been mostly on soybean growers, that type of thing. And then the next concern is what's coming down the pipeline. Is 2,4-D going to be kind of our next big issue that we'll be working with too, which will affect not just north central, south part of the northeast, it's going to affect the western region too. So I just actually met um, a couple days ago with Doug Duhan, who's at Ohio State University. He works with specialty crops, fruits and vegetables. And then Brian Young and Bill Jackson, both from Purdue, uh, they're weed scientists. And we're moving forward with, at this point, maybe not actually having a working group that is a working group per se, but actually trying to get some people together. So in September, it sounds like some of the weeds specialists will be getting together in Purdue and Lafayette, uh, along with a meeting with APCO, the pest control officials. So they'll be talking about it there. And at the same time, um, there's an IR4 meeting going, and so we're going to have a call on that Wednesday, it looks like, to talk about between the weed scientists who do the agronomic crops and the people who work with horticultural specialty crops. We'll probably be bringing in Joe Neal if he's interested from North Carolina State University because he works a lot with nursery crops and is seeing damage there too. I think that's been a big problem um, Doug was just mentioning that they've even seen dicamba damage on like tomatoes in greenhouses. So it's volatilizing and moving into greenhouses. So it's, it's been a big issue. Some of the questions they've gotten when they've talked to growers, where growers said, what are our, our alternatives? If we can't use dicamba, what else is out there? What's the expense? So that's some of the things I think this group will be looking at is some of the teaching and education for people who are both using dicamba and growers who have specialty crops of, for growers who are using dicamba, what are the alternatives? What are the economics? What can you do from now on? And then for specialty crops, how do you talk to your neighbors? How do you look at damage? Who do you call? That type of thing. So we're moving forward. Um, we'll see who's all interested in doing this. Like I said, we have a lot of interest, but I know a lot of, like Larry said, a lot of the weed scientists have almost reached their limit on some of the stuff that they've talked about, even though we are moving forward on it. So if anybody has any questions, just let me know. Thank you, Lene. Um, both Mike and I uh, follow the National Crop Protection Coordinating Committee. If, if you recall, that's a group that uh, came out of the new crop protection program a couple of years ago. And it's, uh, I think on, on a very positive note here, the IPM centers have really rallied around as a supporting group for your IPM coordinators at the state level and also just sort of the overall, uh, the, way it, the way issues begin to funnel up from a state level to state specialists and then broader. So the IPM centers have really been a, a crucial piece of the national response to this issue. And probably a good lesson as we think about um, controversial issues, what's the role at a regional level, at a national level, as we think about what the support is. 
In that uh, next slide, please. In that 2018 um, assessment of uh, what's happening, uh, some of the things that uh, Mike and I saw from the uh, that, that came from the report was that this is our own real teachable moment, folks. Um, you know, we can think about uh, this in terms of how do we respond to issues, how do we respond to those issues that are highly controversial, and what's the the way we support faculty, staff, both at a campus and at a community scale. Um, you know, our experience throughout uh, the history of the land grant has shown that, you know, when we connect those two pieces together and we try to coordinate the response, we're, we're far better off so that we reinforce one another with good, sound, scientific-based information, but we also reinforce our own roles and boundaries. Uh, another aspect that came out of this was that, um, you know, in a regulatory sense, it's also really important for us and this probably happens at both the state specialist level, but also in some states, it's important for the director to get involved in communicating with partner agencies so that those agencies, whether it's the State Department of Ag or Department of Environmental Quality or EPA, they need to understand we're thinking about our role and here's where we see our role stopping and starting. Um, and for sort of those highly controversial topics, as we've said earlier, we went into this, we were really curious about, you know, what, what's going through the, the minds of our state specialists and our county-based educators? Do they feel supported? And if they don't, what, what would make them feel more supported? What's the response from administrative teams on, on DICAMBA? But then as we think about this, you know, what's the lessons learned out of that in terms of how do you support faculty and staff on controversial topics? Um, before we kind of jump completely into public issues education, I, I'd like to turn to a few directors on the line um, that have, have seen this sort of happening in their state firsthand. Uh, those that have, you know, dealt with the issue of role definition and how important that is. Um, as you saw the slides with Larry, um, the South and the Midwest, there's that sort of cluster uh, that goes from, you know, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, all the way up into Minnesota. Bev Durgan is on the line. I see that you've joined us, Bev. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, as a director, how did this come to your attention and what does it mean for how you support your faculty and staff? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, this issue was a major issue in Minnesota, and it came to my attention many ways. One is uh, because I am also a weed scientist, and so I was aware of this issue uh, working with our other uh, weed scientists at Minnesota. But also we were in Minnesota were really called in to be part of this conversation from our uh, Minnesota Soybean Growers Association because they felt this tug from industry. They, there were the issues of it, between soybean growers, soybean growers that were using dicamba tolerant soybeans versus not using them. And then also the relationship with the Department of Ag. And so I was brought in to this issue pretty um, early in the conversation and supporting our state faculty and also our regional educators around making sure that they felt comfortable with the research that they had, you know, and we really stressed that this, our decisions and what we did had to be really research-based. And I think also one of the things that I think all of you know is very important is that, you know, you need to have these relationships before a situation like this comes about. So our relationship with the Minnesota Soybean Growers, I worked very hard with that, knowing the executive director and their farmer leaders, also knowing our Department of Ag, the commissioners and others involved in pesticide regulation. Because when you have this type of situation, it's very controversial that it, this is not the time to introduce yourself to all of these leaders. You need to have that, um, you need to have that relationship. And so, you know, I think my role as an administrator is to really try to make sure that I'm working at that very high level with the agencies and then letting our state faculty do their work. And that work is really, you know, what is the research? What is it showing? And trying to get the education out there to help growers with the information they need and also um, just doing the assessment. So the things like the, you know, the, the podcast and the information, being in the field and just really making sure that the 
state specialists knew that uh, extension administration had their back and that we were really working to make sure that all the other agencies knew what our role was and that how we could help to resolve the issue. Thanks, Bev. Uh, we, were, we will open up for questions here in a moment, but I'd like to get a couple of other perspectives on the table from a few other uh, deans and directors across the country. Uh, Jason Henderson down in Indiana has seen his share of, of this issue. Uh, Jason, maybe from your perspective, you know, how uh, how's it ended up on your desk and, you know, as a director's response, what's that meant? Yeah, I think um, similar to Bev, we had heard uh, from, from producers were talking to us and our, our, our specialist. Um, here at Purdue, the office of the state chemist um, who's responsible for um, pesticides, um, the regulatory aspects is in the College of Agriculture. So we heard it from them quite clearly as the number of uh, incidents uh, started to ramp up on, on that framework as well. Um, I think the, the real thing for us was um, from the educational standpoint, um, how, do, how do we use it to bring um, our specialists and our educators together? Um, one of the things that we did was have um, a one to two day um, training sessions uh, here up on campus as we brought everybody together um, to go through this of figuring out, okay, what's our message going to be across the state so it's consistent? What are some, uh, what is the latest research? How do we package it into um, a, a single PowerPoint and other types of information that, that could be used across the state um, as well? And then a lot of it was focus, focusing on what's our communication plan? Who are we gonna work with? How are we gonna partner with um, our commodity associations? And how are we gonna partner with Farm Bureau to let them know that we have it, we're having this information, we're gonna have various different sessions across um, the, the state. and so. Um, it's one of those things where for us it, it's one of those other opportunities where we can show the value of having capacity um, across the state on these issues that we don't have to wait for RFPs to generate the research um, and at the same time we also um, had our faculty in addition to doing um, discussions on what existing research was was showing and, and doing different things but how do you do new research um, as well on the issue. And so for us, it was um, a really an opportunity for us to pull everybody together, um, rem remind people that we're here in Indiana, we're here to ad address issues, and how do we help um, pull different entities together to have some communications about um, what's happening in the Dicamba area. So um, we did have our share of controversial issues and pushback as you know, various different parts of the ag sector were pushing against each other, but um, it was a time for us to I think, rally resources, identify a common message that was research-based, um, and reinforce that um, we're here to help address issues in agriculture. Another state that has really had to tackle this issue head on uh, is Arkansas. Uh, Vic Ford is on the line. And Vic, I know that um, in talking with Rick Cartwright, uh, you folks have really uh, thought through uh, how you train, how you support agents on Dicama, but there's a good lesson there in terms of work for, workforce preparation, uh, understanding roles, uh, what are the delivery models that uh, we need to be thinking about. So Vic, maybe you could just sort of touch a little bit upon what's this taught Arkansas about how we deliver public issues education. Public issues education, Arkansas with this issue has been a really uh, interesting uh, uh, side note for myself, just coming into the position I am and trying to, to get in the middle of it. Um, one of the things we learned that's already been touched on is that we got to support our folks in the field, the specialist, and as long as they're, support, they're, they're, they're supporting their own sound science and do not get away from that science, I think we're, I think we're in good shape. I have really been proud of our folks and they have just, uh, just stood on their data. And I think that's what we really have to do as administrators is when, when our folks have the science behind them and just, just support them all we can. The issues that we found was that with, particularly with the county agents is that they were caught in the middle because they're in the communities. And being able to support them and having, having uh, uh, understand that, that the administration behind them is supporting them, having the specialists there and giving them the best information we have available. Uh, looking and offering solutions, but we had a lot of folks that, that would uh, 
that it, it almost was like a feud uh, coming from the Southern Appalachians. It reminded me of the Hatfields and McCoys sometimes. But what, you, what we ended up having is, is a lot of folks on both sides of the issue, good people on both sides of the issue. And what we really tried to do is try to make sure that our folks had the best information and, uh, and knew that we were behind them, behind them 100%. And, and being able to do that would, would help us get through that. And there are still contentions there. Uh, one of the things we notice is as we stood on our data, uh, you know, the folks would, uh, would uh, start into personal attacks of our, of, our, of our county agents and our faculty, but we just told them, I said, we've got the data, we stand on it, and we've got your back. And, and, and being able to do that kept the morale, and although it was a lot of stress for a lot of folks on the, on the front lines, knowing that the folks that, that, were, behind, that were behind them uh, to that they, they didn't have to worry about that we're going we're gonna to cut them loose uh, as, long as, they, as long as they stood by the data we were behind them. Thanks, Rick. I think we should go ahead and sort of open up to other questions here from directors, um, to sort of think our way through uh, either some lessons that they've learned with Dicamba or other controversial topics and the way we address those in extension. Why don't we just sort of uh, see uh, if there are others that would like to participate, tell us a little bit more about uh, how they have handled controversial issues. Are there missing components? If we were to create uh, a little list here of some best practices, best approaches, either what you've heard on the phone, what you've experienced, what, what else would go on that list of best education practices on controversial topics? This is Bev Durgan, and one thing that we did in Minnesota is that we involved our extension communications people pretty early in this conversation. Again, as what Jason said, is to make sure that we had a common message, that everybody uh, knew what that message was. And then we also, our communicators here also have a network with the Department of Ag's communicators and the, the soybean growers communicators. And so they work together too. And I think that's very helpful when you're trying to get the message out. But I think the most, um, the thing that was not surprising to me, but it always is surprising when, um, as was just mentioned earlier about what happened in Arkansas, when the attacks started to get personal you know, it's one thing to attack the data, but people were being attacked personally by, uh, it was primarily through the industry. And, you know, that is where you really have to support your faculty and, and educators and making sure that they know what their message is. And also what they can do, you know, when they start seeing these personal attacks, what their response can be. And again, it's, it's based on the science, it's based on the research. And some of these things, you know, you have to uh, make sure that you can support them and that they just have to let this go. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, they, they, this was a product that they wanted to sell. There was litigation happening. And um, sometimes you just have to also give people permission to be able to step back from this because when it, when it becomes personal, that, that's a very hard thing for uh, many of our specialists to handle because they, um, you know, they're very committed to their growers and it's really tough when they, when they, when they see that. We were involved also uh, at the, simultaneously with an issue with a, a, uh, a, a hog breeding facility within the uh, uh, Buffalo River watershed, which is a national scenic river. And we work um, again, uh, this got so political that the groups were uh, accusing us of destroying the uh, Buffalo River. And as we had our monitoring out there from this, from the go, our data was not supporting it. And again, having the support, uh, the specialists knowing they had the support of the administration behind them. And, you know, you know, we were open with the data. We were uh, we had the data open to anyone who wanted to analyze it, which many people did. And, uh, um, you, as you can imagine what happened uh, as other people tried to analyze the data in, in certain ways uh, that we we kept uh, again the support of having the, the, the administration saying we've got your back we'll support you know just stick with your data and we will stick with you and I think that's a the, both those lessons were really good for uh, 
Arkansas. And, and you know, we, I will talk to my faculty who were involved in both projects and they will tell you that that's the biggest thing they appreciate from, from the administration. Thank you, Vic. Uh, just a reminder, uh, please jump into this conversation. You might want to unmute your microphone or you can use the chat box too. I'll, I'll try to monitor that. So please jump in and, and share your thoughts or ask any of the folks you hear speak a uh, question. I was just, this is Larry uh, Steckel, but I was just going to chime in. I thought Dr. Cartwright, Cartwright over in Arkansas was absolutely awesome on how he, he backed his specialists. Um, I can't, the, the, the stuff thrown at those, those guys and that whole, whole system, I just can't, can't imagine. Um, and, and again, I uh, just reiterate what others have said, but having, having the backing of your administration when you're standing on your data uh, is, is invaluable. And, um, you know, and I know we had CEOs from some of those companies come to visit administrators. That was a little unnerving, I tell you, for some of the, some of my colleagues in other states. Um, and uh, again, just having that backing, uh, that, you know, as long as they're standing on their data, uh, you're with them, that, that goes a long way. I'd like to, uh, you know, just kick in on there uh, after Larry to say, you know, again, going back to the, the survey that was done, I thought that's what was uh, good to see, so good to see is that uh, you know, extension we specialists primarily I think that uh, that responded to the survey. They I think they were probably felt comfortable being honest on it. I'm pretty sure they were, and you know they really there was questions around that that um, question of did they get the kind of support they needed from their administration? And I mean I I I don't know Rob I can't remember that there was any or maybe Lene can remember. I don't think there's any responses that indicated, you know, they didn't have good response. So I thought that was a, a really good thing to see in the survey. Um, one other thing I, I want to throw in there is a maybe a maybe a dis discussion topic is how how can we? My observation is, you know, like the, the land grant system extension is so powerful because it is locally driven and state based and all that. But sometimes there's these issues that are broader national issues get a lot of national attention. And it takes a while for, you know, that kind of coordination to happen and to, you know, uh, sharing uh, ideas and experiences and, you know, strategizing together. And I'm just wondering how everyone thinks about that. Like in a case like Dicamba, is there a way that do we need to have ways to more quickly get together as a system and talk about the issue, you know, bring er each other up to date on the issue and then Talk about does there need to be coordination? I mean, are there educational programs we could work together on? I mean, these sorts of things. I wonder if there's any thoughts on that too. Uh, this is Bev Durgan. I think that um, we need, as administrators, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we support our specialists, but also our educators local in their professional development. And that means making sure that there is funding available for them to go to their professional societies because I think the weed scientists around the country are very connected to each other. They're connected through their regional societies and their national. And, you know, I was on a number of listservs and conversations. You know, our weed scientists got together very quickly and we're talking about this issue and sharing information, sharing data. You know, a lot of the data on dicamba is data that um, was collected a long time ago about the chemistry of this uh, particular product and this herbicide and um, you, you know just the impact of the environment on the volatility of this product and so I think it's very important that we make sure that those opportunities are available to our very discipline based specialists so they can have those connections so you know uh, and then also for us to pay attention but um, they responded pretty quickly I think um, and especially now that you know, with listservs and and other ways that they connect, you know, Google Hangouts. They were they were on top of this and they knew it was going on, you know, throughout the US pretty quickly. Turning to the chat box here for a second, this is 
be a great question um, just for anyone or especially one of the directors who uh, we called upon. The question is, how should relatively new extension administrators and directors address the public policy issues if their relationships with uh, growers, grower groups or even agencies are not quite as strong as they should be, especially early on in that administrator's tenure? This is Bev Durgan. I don't mean to um, to talk as much, but you know, I think for a new administrator is that there there are other people within the organization that have those relationships. So, um, you know, if they're the dean of the colleges of agriculture, if you're working under them or or separate, but also you know the state faculty also have those connections, especially with the with the grower groups, and so. You know, again, I think you have to reach out to others within, you know, the university, but also the state faculty, if they've been there a while, have those kind of connections and do that. So, um, you know, it, is, it can be a st steep learning curve, but I think th those connections exist within the organization and it's important to find those. I think, the other, I think this is Jason Henderson. And I think the other thing is, is in our group, even our specialists that were relatively new to the state, um, they also, they had built some connections with um, their colleagues in other states. And it seemed like there's a lot of connections that flowed through on a regional level and state to state. And so there was a lot of the communication and support um, across colleagues and across universities that I think was really helpful to tap into that. Um, network um, that we have in extension. So that was, I think, very helpful as well and something um, for new extension directors or even new faculty that are on, um, on campus. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but if there are other issues, uh, please, uh, Answer, ask your question, uh, put it in the chat box. I've tried to capture a few um, summary points here from this broad discussion and, uh, and share that in the chat box with you um, in bullet format. Maybe as we reach closure here for this webinar, just some summary points here that I've heard and feel free to jump in here at the end of my list that um, some of the, the ideas for maybe best practices involve your communication professionals from your institution as early on as you can. Think about advanced ways for communicating with partners um, before the controversy erupts. I mean, in other words, think about the strength of that partnership and how important that is as you uh, find yourself in the midst of doing public issues education with an agency or with a critical stakeholder group. Um, we've heard a number of times that issues themselves can be that catalyst to bring our specialists and our agents together and maybe even think about ways in which you can even do more of that when you're in the throes of something controversial. Um, giving attention to sort of the new ways or new or different ways of how controversial uh, information is delivered. That might also include this idea of uh, the importance of role definition. Um, think about responding with partners uh, on some of these topics to, to make sure that your State Department of Ag or Department of Environmental Quality uh, understands your role definition uh, and be able to clarify that early on and then be part of the package that's presented uh, in response to a controversial topic. Um, I think a couple of times we've talked about the unique position that Cooperative Extension is in nationally. Uh, an issue that rises up today and highly controversial doesn't, we don't have time to wait and submit a request for funding somewhere. We're on the ground there and we need to be as proactive as possible uh, to avoid getting put into a reactionary position. Um, I think it's also important, uh, we heard from Vic and from Bev talk about the importance that faculty need to feel that they are supported. There's a perception issue here as an administrator to make sure uh, that both state and local agents feel that they're not uh, caught in the middle and left hung out to dry. And I think Bev's uh, comment that I wrote down that I thought was really a, a seminal piece here is to be, uh, to be proactive as an administrator, especially knowing that uh, you're probably dealing with an issue that turns personal at some point and try to think our way through that 
in advance of when the storm clouds hit. Are there any other observations out there from folks on the phone that'd like to add to my little list of best practices? Robin, this is Ed, and I, and I, you know, just to hit a summary point on that, it sounds like that it's a continual reminder that um, administrators need to be actively engaged with our partners and with our own faculty um, continually to make sure that they're aware of, of the support we have for our faculty and the connections we have with partners so that none of us get caught by surprise. Thanks for that observation, Ed. I think uh, Mike and I will turn it back to you at this point. All right. Well, I want to thank you and Mike um, for leading this session today and arranging our speakers and the great topic that we had to, uh, to really delve into that because this can crop up in a number of different contexts, not just in a, a crop issue. It happens in livestock, as Vic pointed out. It can happen following a natural disaster of some sort. So we need to be prepared to um, handle these issues quickly and effectively and, and take advantage of the unique position we stand in uh, extension to be able to make a difference for the people that we serve. So with that, I'm gonna close it out. Thank everyone for participating today. This was recorded. If you want to share that with colleagues who are unable to participate today, um, and uh, will be available on the ECOT Monday Minute uh, link to this. So, again, thank you, and I wish everyone a happy weekend. All right, take care.